loves, God loves, all that God loves. Think about, think about that. Think about it. Because everything that comes out of creation is beloved by God. And that, that's a game changer because you're not now stuck by yourself wondering, is God going to find me? Or is God going to be angry with me? Because you're immersed in this whole world of creation that God has always only ever loved. And you're now the effect. You're the effect of that love. Mm -hmm. and that, that's a game changer for how we think about people, but it's also a game changer for how we think about what the life of faith is fundamentally about. Yeah. That was Norman Wurzba, and Norman is the first guest of this inaugural episode of Waystations podcast. I'll tell you about the podcast in a minute, but first let me introduce you to Norman. He is the author of This Sacred Life, Humanity's Place in a Wounded World. He's also the author, uh, more recently, of Agrarian Spirit, Cultivating Faith, Community, and the Land. Both these books have been quite significant to me uh, as of late, and I highly commend them to you. He is the Gilbert T. Rowe Distinguished Professor of Theology at Duke University Divinity School and the Senior Fellow at Duke's Keenan Institute for Ethics. Um, so you're going to meet him in a minute. We'll be talking about both these books. Um, Waystations podcast, let me just give you a little bit of a uh, background to that. I've been wanting to do a podcast for a while, but not quite sure I could commit to the time. Um, most people expect a podcast to be uh, fairly regular. I don't think I can do that. I'm a traveling musician, and so I don't know if I can do them once a week or once a month or just from time to time. I think chances are it's going to be from time to time. And the reason why I call it way stations is because I'm a traveler, and a way station is a stopping or a resting place on a pilgrim's journey. And it's a place that you stop at the end of your long day of traveling, and you get food, and you get drink, and you get company, and you get news from other lands, and you share ideas, and sort of refresh and get ready for the next days of traveling. And I do a lot of traveling in my life, and I meet some wonderful people. And I'm excited to be able to have a chance to share them with you. So as I meet them, I'll share them. So this is Way Station's podcast, and I'm Steve Bell. How are you doing, Norm? It's great to see you, Steve. Yeah, you too. You too. You're at Duke? Yes, I'm at Duke. It's been a long time since I've been with you, so I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, it'll be great. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad you could do this. Um, I already introduced you and uh, and 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 you know your work and a little bit like that, and as a, as also as a, a a very fine guitar player. So my first question is, are you getting any guitar time these days? Well, you see my resonator back there. Yeah, I was noticing. It's been yeah. sitting on the wall too much. Oh yeah. You no, know, last year I had some leave time, and so I I had some friends come over and we'd play music, but it was just too sparse. I mean, I got to do more of it. And we've got some really fine players, you know, yeah. among students and faculty. So yeah. just got to make time for it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I hope you do. So I wanted to, uh, you know, introduce like the people that you know are interested in the things I'm interested in. <laughs> to you. Um, yeah. you're, you're, you have been a, a fairly big voice in my ear for the last couple of years through COVID, uh, through two books. Um, oh, I'm so, sorry uh, about that. This Sacred Life, <laughs> Norman Wurzba. And uh, then one which which I I think is kind of like a second in a series almost, but the agrarian spirit. How do I do that? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, so I wanted to talk about those because I think people would be interested in in uh, in them. First, I, I wanted to ask you what what kind of theologian are you? This, I mean, this sort of says that you are the Gilbert T. Rowe oh, Distinguished yeah. Professor of Theology at Duke University Divinity School, um, but like, are like, but you, you talk a lot about dirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Are I'm... you are you a dirt theologian? I've got like the, one of the first articles I ever read of you that caught my eye. You talked about you talk about soil, and the the quote is "soil is redeemed death." Yeah, yeah. And that kind of caught me. And another another article: soil is the site of resurrection. Right. And and that like when I read those, I I haven't heard people talk like that. So like, who is this guy? What's he yeah. talking about? And those those phrases have never left me. So what kind of theologian are you? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm not a very typical theologian to start yeah. with. I think part of it is that, you know, I I grew up farming. And so so much of the way I think about things is a reflection of an agricultural community's way of being. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that a lot of folks who teach at universities, whether it's theology or philosophy, they're not farmers and farmers don't show up on a syllabus. Right. But for me, farming realities are fundamental because all of us have to eat. We all have to take care of our bodies, clothe them, house them. 
move them around. And that means we have to pay close attention to the land and the water and the air and the atmosphere, all of it making what we do possible. And mm -hmm. I remember studying theology years ago and then doing a PhD in philosophy. I discovered that they weren't talking about this. Right. The major thinkers, you know, in, in traditions were not talking about things like soil and water and plant and animal life as if these were just sort of backdrop to the things that people do. And so when I became friends with Wendell Berry, he really helped me think through what does it look like to do theology from the perspective of the land, mm -hmm. oriented to the land, but then also understanding the role of land in God's purposes for everything. Mm -hmm. And so that put me on, I think, a, a rather unusual trajectory. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad to see that when I started doing this, there weren't many folks working in this agrarian way, but now there's more and more. Mm. And it's really exciting because we're we're seeing that the way we read scripture, the way we think about big cultural issues, they all have a different sort of look and feel when you come at them from the perspective of land. You know, it was uh, years ago, I was uh, I was with an indigenous elder and I had been doing some work as sort of an ally. I'm not quite sure I like that word uh, with right. an, an indigenous um, led justice pro project. And afterward, I, I said to him, how, how, how do I become a good ally? Yeah. And, and he looked at me and he said, um, he said, become indigenous. And then he waved his finger and says, I didn't say become Indian. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That's not yeah, what yeah. I said. Do not hear yeah. that. He yeah, said, yeah. but become a rooted person, uh, um, uh, someone who grows out of the soil where you live. Yeah. And at the time, the, it didn't really make any sense. Like, I wasn't quite sure what he meant. It sounded a little bit more romantic. Right. Um, I think during COVID, when all of a sudden I had time, I've always been a city boy, always been urban. Um, I mean, yeah, I like walks on the beach or by the river, but I, 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 most, I mostly read on my couch, right? right? But all of a sudden I had time and I started going to the same spot every day by a river near our house and i sat on the same rock and i watched the same scene and that yeah. river that same river flow by every every single day and it became quiet because nobody was out driving those first few months and so right. there was no distant hum of a highway yeah um and i started to notice i started to attend to the place and started seeing things i'd never seen before i started feeling things and i remember this one particular day the river was rolling by and i was just feeling that roll by that that passing yeah and then all of a sudden i don't know how to describe this and i, I don't know if i've ever told anybody this but it's all of a sudden i felt it i felt the cosmos flowing through me wow yeah it was a sense of that that it wasn't just the river that was rolling by but that all of creation was rolling by and i am this conscious moment um, somehow collecting and releasing and feeling part of things in a way I hadn't before and no language for it. Yeah. Um, and what you're describing is beautiful, Steve. And I'll tell you that it's an experience that, you know, is not unusual for people who are closely tied to the land. I mean, I mean, I think about some of the farming people I grew up with and, you know, I've not been farming for years and years, so I'm, I'm drawing a lot on memory and then also what other people have told me who are in the work, but, you know, to be, in a in a field and to have worked this land to have grown your food or grown crops or mm -hmm. to have worked with animals chickens pigs cattle whatever it is you do begin to feel the world moving through your body mm -hmm. and this is something that that people who just shop for everything they need they don't feel mm -hmm. and, and it's not it's not just a cognitive thing right it's it's an embodied feeling that you have and that's so important to stress because it's a it's a felt thing that happens through tactile engagement, right? So for you, you know, being in a place and becoming attentive, opening your senses mm -hmm. to what's around you is such a shock to many people who otherwise, and I'm guilty of this like everybody else, we're flying through this world. We're mm -hmm. so busy. We're so driven. We got so much to do that we don't take the time to notice, let alone take the time to become deeply attentive and then also immersive in the realities, mm -hmm. right? So that, you know, if you're, if you're growing, say a tomato or raspberries or, or whatever, and you've been, you know, tending these plants and you've gone out and you've watered and you've weeded and you stick that, you know, sun gold cherry tomato in your mouth or a mm -hmm. raspberry in your mouth, you feel it tastes different. Yeah. 
than what you would get in a store. Now, how do you describe that difference? Well, to a person who hasn't experienced it bodily, they're going to say there's no difference. Mm -hmm. But for the person who has, there yeah. is a difference. And I think, I think this is something that, you know, speaking of an indigenous writer, Robin Wall Kimmerer says this beautifully in one of her books, Braiding Sweetgrass. She says people actually need to feel the land as a place of blessing, mm. the land as a place that nurtures your body and doesn't just nurture your body, but loves and welcomes your presence in the world. Because if we don't feel welcomed, mm. right, into the world in which we actually live and from which we draw our living, that's going to create all kinds of psychic disturbance. And I think a lot of people feel that. And that's part of what this rootlessness is about. The people don't know where they belong. Right. Yeah. yeah but if yeah. you've got an attachment and you're attentive and immersed in a place, you start to feel belonging. And that does important things for a person. Yeah. Because you know that you matter. Yeah. Right? For starters, yeah. That your life isn't just some big freaking accident, but that it's part of a larger world which is beautiful and fragrant and sometimes delicious, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, to, to even feel its benevolence, you know, I was, I was reading this, um, I wanted to show you this uh, book, uh, Douglas John Hall. Do you know this guy? Oh, I do. I know him, yeah. Yeah, so this book, in, in, like in, in this, he talks about, you know, humanity's sort of mad pursuit of mastery over nature, as if, if nature is the enemy to be conquered. Right. Um, and how that's become disastrous. But I think, I mean, I, like we just pulled carrots the other day and my wife is a wonderful gardener. We've got a small little plot in the backyard yeah. and she, the, what she can get out of that, like the amount of just gorgeous food that she can pull out of that small yeah. little plot is quite astonishing. But my favorite day every year, every year, and I'm not a gardener. I, I garden because Nancy gardens and I love yeah. her when she's gardening. Right. And she loves gardening. Right. And so she comes alive in a way that I just I just like being near her when she's gardening. But yeah. the best day of the year is always the pulling of the carrots. Yeah. And you've got this big mound on your piece of on your grass and you're washing off the dirt and it's gorgeous. And those right. carrots have that buttery yeah. sort of thing. But you feel the blessing of the earth. You feel the hospi hospitality of the earth and the welcome. Right. Um, in a way that you sort of, you honestly feel, I think the earth likes me. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know. It's, you know, rather than being my enemy that, that, you know, and I know the earth can also be disastrous and frightening and, and all those. Well, it can be dangerous for very sure. Very dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, the thing you, you mentioned something really important the desire to control the world, have mastery over the world. What that actually does is it destroys the possibility of having a relationship with the world. Yeah. Right. So think about how, you know, many cultures, agricultural, but also indigenous native cultures, they talk about the personhood of the creatures of the land itself. Right. Right. And they mean something really important by that. It's not just a metaphor. It's actually a description about how as embodied beings, humans are meant to be in an embodied relationship with the world and in their relationship, feel a kind of resonance. Right. with that world, right? Where you become receptive and open to what the world has to offer. And you can't do that when you're trying to control the world, right? right? Control already says, I'm really not that interested in who you are and what your life could possibly be without me around. I mean, think about how, if you want to destroy an interpersonal relationship, just come into the room one day and say to your other, Hey, I'm going to control you from here on out. Mm -hmm. The relationship's over Yeah, yeah. from that moment. Yeah. Right, at least a, a relationship that has any of the characteristics of, of love and fellow feeling, mm -hmm. and that becomes now a relationship between you and another who is now an object. They've lost their independence, their integrity, their sanctity, and and that's a problem when we do that to the whole world. I mean, we're doing it to people too. But yeah, but, it's a, in a sense that rather than welcome the other, we we're infecting the other. Yeah. Right. And so I, I want to, which brings me to a word that I want you to talk about before we talk about your books, this word okay. Anthropocene. Right. So Anthropocene, um, right. which I first heard in an article of yours. Oh, what was this called? Um, I wrote it down here. Can we live in a world without Sabbath? Rethinking the human in the Anthropocene. Right. And I just went there because Norm Wurzba's name was on it. And then it's like, what the heck is the Anthropocene? <laughs> right. And I'm going to assume yeah, that yeah. most of my listeners here don't know that word. Sure. Um, now yeah. I'm seeing it everywhere. But yeah, it's possible? a fancy term that we yeah. got from Earth scientists who were saying that when you look at the history of the planet, right, over its millions and millions of years, there are different epochs. 
But over the last roughly 10 to 12,000 years, there's been this epoch where the weather, this is important, the weather has been stable, pretty reliable, which meant that in this roughly 10 to 12,000 year period, human societies, cultures, civilizations could take off and grow. Right. And we've seen them, right? All across the planet, there have been these great civilizations that were, you know, doing important things in agriculture. They, they could were doing flower. things around energy, right? All these yeah. important things. That's called the Holocene. But what happened Holocene in the year is two... sun, right? Hollow. Uh, like yes. That. Yes. Okay. Well, and, and yeah, and it, it's just referring to this period in which there's the, a kind of stability in which all sorts of um, efforts to work with the earth could be very successful. Right. Okay. Right. Right. We're, we're, we're not going to have a major ice age. that's going to come down and just wipe out all right. sorts of life, for instance. Right. So what happens in the year 2000, earth system scientists are meeting for a, me a meeting in Mexico. And one of the scientists, Paul Crutzen, he says, wait a minute, we're not in the Holocene anymore. We're in the Anthropocene. And the reason he called it the Anthropocene is the Greek word anthropos means human. And he said, the reason we have to call it the Anthropocene is because human beings, through their developed economies, their industrial practices, their technological innovation, what they have done now is they've really taken control of the world, meaning that there isn't an ecosystem process, a biogeophysical chemical process that isn't affected by human power, human technology. Mm -hmm. So think about how... The burning of fossil fuels has put all this CO2 in the atmosphere, which is now creating climate change, which is affecting all of the life forms on this planet. Or think about how the development of genetic technologies, right, biotech, but also human engineering has made it possible for us to do all kinds of interventions in plant and animal life. So that where you look from the cell all the way to the atmosphere and everywhere in between, mm -hmm. we can't talk about something being natural anymore. Hmm. Because the whole concept of nature has been superseded by this power of human beings to re-engineer, remake the world in ways that are satisfying to them. And there's been a lot of discussion about is Anthropocene the best word? Should it be capitalocene? Should it be plantationocene? I mean, there's all hmm. kinds of fighting about that. And that's not important, but well, it is sort of. But what's important is to recognize that human beings have learned to exercise the kind of power that now will determine the future of the whole planet and all of its life forms. Yeah. Right. And this is such an important sort of development because historically people always thought themselves small in the face of nature's power. Right. Now we think of ourselves as the power that determines the fate of nature. It's a kind of reversal. I mean, it's still the case that nature's got great power, right? Floods and things like yep. this can still wreak havoc with human intentions. Yep. But in the main, what human beings are doing now is determining all life on this planet. And the question is, is this a good thing? Yeah. Is this power somehow um, gone renegade and has now become a force that threatens to actually do in the human race? When you think about the amount of you know climate refugee migration there's going to be i mean there's just so many things coming down the road that are truly frightening because we're talking about food insecurity civil instability all kinds of things well this uh, this again this this book which is which i consider a nice on ramp to yours but uh, he says just at the point where human mastery becomes a real possibility and the world show the world shows terrible evidence of our lack of wisdom and our lack of goodness and then he says we're not good masters. We're neither wise enough nor good enough to be masters. And right. and so I, th I think we're. I think most of us are sort of feeling. Well, that just might be true. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, I think yeah. a lot of people did not anticipate that the effort to make human life as comfortable as possible is going to result in tens of millions of people having suffering that should not have been coming their way, but will yeah. because of things like climate change. Right. Right. Okay. So that's Anthropocene. Right. So then let's, let's talk about your book. Um, let's talk about the sacred um, life. So okay. uh, humanity's place in a wounded world. So, I mean, your first chapter is facing the Anthropocene. Right. Right. Which uh, would you say more about that? Well, it just, I mean, the way I set up the book was I wanted to ask two big, well, three big questions really, right? What kind of a world are we in? What is a human being? And what should human beings do? So the first two chapters are just taking a look at where we have come mm -hmm. in the way we think about planet Earth, 
and where we have come in our thinking about what's a human being. Mm -hmm. And the Anthropocene chapter is saying that we are in this sort of tragic position now where the effort to remake the world now undoes the very world we need to survive. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that, that shows how our thinking about the world is really off right. and, and, and off in a really bad way. The second chapter about that transhumanist urge takes a look at, well, how are we thinking about the human being? And what transhumanists are doing is they're helping us see how for many folks, there's deep dissatisfaction with the human body and human limitations, our human finitude, our vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And so they long for a world where we can remake, right? Engineer humans right. to be better, right? And that means artificial intelligence. It means genetic modification. It means putting on, you know, technological prostheses onto our bodies, mm -hmm. because these all become ways to move past the biological finitude that characterize each and every human life. And so I, I, with these two chapters, I'm saying, wait a second, you know, our best efforts to think about the world and to think about human beings basically mean the undoing of the planet and the undoing of what we think a human being is. How did we get here? Mm -hmm. Right? There's so much, I think, confusion, but also distortion about what it means to be human. And so in the second part of the book, what I wanted to do is say, well, what are some basic things that we just have to understand if we're going to talk about anything that relates to a genuinely human life. And I sort of focus on two features, right? That human life is always rooted life because we need nurture from the ground, literally. Right. Yeah. And you talk about that, like you, like, like a plant, like, exactly. a, like a rye, like a, like a, a, a stalk of rye grass that's yes. got, you know, thousands of feet of, of, exactly. of tentacles going in needing that well, soil. and we'd like to think that we're way above plants, right? Because we can move around. We don't actually have physical roots. But the thing is, it takes just a moment's reflection to realize we, in fact, are rooted because, you know, in a few minutes, I'm going to have to eat because it's close to supper time. Yeah. And I'm going to need to drink and I'm going to need to breathe and I'm going to need to be touched. I'm going to need all these things that signal my attachment yeah. to a place that makes possible my biological existence, but not just my biological existence, because as we were talking earlier, the reason we want to attend to places that we want to immerse ourselves in places is that there is this tremendous spiritual awakening that happens when you realize that you're not some isolated bit cut off mm -hmm. from the world, but you're actually deeply enmeshed or entangled within the world. And so that leads to that second chapter in the second part, where besides saying that we're rooted beings, we're always enmeshed beings, meaning that the world we live in always depends upon us being connected in visceral ways, right? Not just in optional voluntary ways, but in mm -hmm. visceral ways with the lives of plants and animals and insects and bugs and microbes and soil processes, hydrological cycles, atmospheric processes, all of it is absolutely crucial to our bodies being able to do what we do. And, and when you, you, when you list that litany right there, it's actually exhilarating. It's like you start to feel, Oh my goodness, this is, it's exhilarating. At one point, I don't know if it's the sac uh, sacred life or agrarian spirit where you talk about the human being, where you say you're not an individual, you're a zoo. Right, right. And, yeah. You know, and you talk about, I don't know, 37 billion microbes in your body or something that you're host yes. to. And I remember again walking there, I'm thinking about this, and I start to realize like I get to carry all these creatures. Right. I'm a, I'm a walking zoo. And there was there was um there was a kind of a cartoonish feel. To this, I could almost sort of sense this this feeling of all all of us thirty seven billion creatures walking down this pathway, kind yeah. of de delighting each, in each other. Yeah. Um. And 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 I realized I'm not making that up. No, like, you're not. not. It's actually the it's the truth of our being. And the thing yeah. is, it's a real shock to the way we've been trained to think about ourselves, especially yeah. in sort of neoliberal, highly Americanized ways of thinking about people, mm -hmm. where the important thing to say about you is that you're an individual. Mm -hmm. right? You're self-standing, you're self-authorizing, mm -hmm. you're autonomous, you're free because you get to do whatever you want. But if you start with the recognition that you are always a zoo, meaning that you are not yourself, you're not single, mm -hmm. you're always host and dependent upon mm -hmm. billions of other organisms mm -hmm. and their lives make your living possible. Mm -hmm. 
now suddenly you can't be so cocky yeah. in thinking that you are a separable individual being that sort of floats above the earth. Mm -hmm. We're always in the earth yeah. in all senses of that term mm -hmm. because the earth is always in us. Yeah. yeah. And if the earth were ever to cease being in us, there would be no life at all. Yeah. Well, we are so it's, a dumb, it's a, right? It's a, yeah. real, it's a real shocker to make that realization that you yeah. are not, I mean, the skin that we have tempts us to think that we are enclosed beings, but we're not. Yeah. Right? yeah. It starts with our belly buttons. If we didn't have belly buttons, none of us could be. But what does the belly button communicate? But our dependence upon a mother and a womb. Yeah. Yeah. So dependence and, marks us. And, and a loving mutuality between two people. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, uh, Malcolm Guide helped me see this one time. And, and uh, uh, in one of his lectures, he gave where he talks about, okay, I'm going to, I'm, let's leave Malcolm out of it now. I'm, now I'm going to how I've thought about it since. But um, when my dad was dying and, and I'm observing my father die, and in some ways he taught me how to die well. But I remember yeah. thinking, when I'm, when I'm there, if I'm allowed to think a and be you know conscious and re being reflective, and if I allow myself to think, what do I like the most about Steve Bell on my deathbed? What would that be? And then I realized that everything I really cherish about me is dependent on someone else. Yeah, I'm a son. I kind of need parents, right? To be a son, I'm a husband. I kind of need a spouse. Um, I'm a father. I kind of need children. I'm a neighbor. I kind of need neighbors. I'm a friend. I kind of need friends. Right. I'm a public musician. I kind of need an audience. Right. So everything I love about me, about my life, yeah, actually requires someone else for that to be true. Right. And that's just one level of existence. That's not the the microbe level. That's not the the you know, our yeah. you know, some sunlight or water or, or right. systems. Right. So it's it, it and if you think back to and I and I know that I mean you're a you're a Christian, you're not just right. a scientist or Right. Uh, you know, when we think about uh, Trinitarian theology, you know, and whatever else that might mean that right. God in God's very nature is a com communal being. Right. And, you know, um, and they, they need each other to be what they are. Well, and what this does is it gives you a fundamentally different way about thinking of reality. Mm -hmm. right? I think in a sort of neoliberal context, you're trained to think that you enter into relationships. Right. And you get to choose them, right? Mm -hmm. I want those. I don't want those. And we sort of make an identity around the choices we make about who we're going to be in relationship right. with. And I don't mean to knock all of that, but that's not true. Mm -hmm. Because at a much deeper level, we are constituted by our relationships. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we can enter into yes. some or we can refuse some. But the fact about us is that without relationships, that we either are going to acknowledge or not, that we're either going to honor or not, we can't live. Yeah. And so relationality is the heart of all being. Right. So instead of thinking about the world as consisting of a whole mess of individuals that we then can relate to as we want to, the whole world is a mess of relations. Yeah. A mess and there is the word you it, phrase. For, yeah. yeah, there is no individual of any kind. Yeah. That's a shocking realization. Yeah. There, there are no individuals. There are only relations in relations. Yeah. And, you know, we exist for a time as, you know, the what, what what's the best word? I, I mean, I use the image of when you're looking at a river to come back to your earlier image. Right. Right. And you see an eddy in that river sometimes. It's this swirl. Mm -hmm. And the minute you were to try to pick it out, it would disappear. Yep. Because that that world is all dependent upon the water moving all around it. And in fact, each human life is like a world mm -hmm. where you try to extricate it from all of those living elements moving around us and through us. Mm -hmm. We would cease to exist. And but so if you the, start, if you start, how, attending, you, how do you honor the world? Yeah. But, and if, but, but if you start attending to it, which I at, at the, the, the young age of 62, <laughs> I feel I'm just beginning to get a handle or the tools to attend because I'm so urbanized. I'm so individualized uh, in my theology, in my life, everything I do. Yeah. And it's not like I haven't been paying attention at all, but I'm 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 starting to get a feel for this. And what really comes weirdly is joy because it's yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a it's this unbelievable choreography yeah you know, and and yes you can you can break an ankle i mean i'm not saying it's not like you know but 
there is something in there that that is just so um, joyous and energizing if you start to let it, like if you, if you start to attend to it that way yeah. and honor it rather than try to fight it. Well, and what it does, and, and this can also be taken the wrong way, it enlarges the sense of your own being. Yeah. It enlarges the sense of the awe we ought to feel in the presence of any living being. Mm. Because whenever we see a living being, another person, we don't just see that person. We see a whole world that is making that person, that being mm. possible. And, you know, theologically, this is hugely important because what it means is that, you know, many traditions of theological reflection that say it's about God and you, mm -hmm. they're fundamentally mistaken mm. because it's never just between God and you. It's between God, you, and everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if God cares about you, God has to care about everything. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, if God cares about everything, that means that God's care for you is so important, mm -hmm. right? It's so valuable because everything that comes out of creation is beloved by God. And that, that's a game changer because you're not now stuck by yourself wondering, is God going to find me or is God going to be angry with me? Because you're immersed in this mm -hmm. whole world of creation that God has always only ever loved. Mm -hmm. And you're now the effect you're the effect of that love. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a game changer for how we think about people, but it's also a game changer for how we think about what the life of faith is fundamentally about. Yeah. Well, I remember as a little boy, um, and I, then we need to move on because I, I don't want people to check out before we talk about the next book. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember as, 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 I remember as a little boy, uh, before I had sort of an overt Christian faith, um, being on the, my back, like only because I was too young, not, you know, right. but, um, uh, uh, I was on the back porch and I'm looking out at the stars at night and I lived in this little town. So there wasn't a whole lot of, um, you know, light pollution and you could, you know, see the stars. And, and I just, I just remember feeling the deep space benevolence. I don't know yeah. how, how else to call what, what else. Like, I just felt the goodwill um, that I was sort of caught up in this goodwillness. And then when I started hearing the stories of Jesus, the reason probably I became a Christian is that just resonated with what I already felt. Yeah. You know, when I when I started getting kind of a, a, an idea who this this individual was and what was being communicated through that life, death, resurrection, all that, I said that well, that you know that that actually resonates with what I kind of have known since I was a kid. Yeah. Uh, instinctively, I just before we move on, I just want I just want to my favorite words but quote. Um, all creation is divine love, variously made visible, tactile, fragrant, auditory, delectable. Lavish and hospitable, inspiring, inspiring enjoyment and delight. Oh yeah, <laughs> um, that, that is such a great. I, I, I slightly modified just because it reads better <laughs> than the content you were, but that is such um. This this book, I, I really do recommend it for for and anybody starting to. I mean, we're we're in this very dangerous time right now, and the future doesn't look really great. Um, it's hard to be very hopeful. Um. But there is still a way of of engaging the world in a way that while we face what's coming, there can there can be just sort of a natural delight and joy that can sustain the fight in a sense. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And I think what's gonna make it possible for people to still live, you know, in a way that honors the dignity of persons and places yeah. is if we can figure out how to love persons and places yeah. and love ourselves and see the yeah. beauty in a world that even as it's being marred and destroyed or degraded, yeah, it's still worth cherishing. Well, you said in, a, in an interview I, I actually listened to this morning, someone asked you about hope and you and you were sort of suggesting that hope is not the best word right now. Like that it's not so much a how do we how do we animate or instill hope, but how do we animate love? Yeah. Um, and how do how do we, you know, sort of keep that kindled? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that. Yeah. Yeah. It's so important because, you know, as I think about hope, I'm writing a little book on hope right now. What I've learned is that so many young people, they're deeply suspicious of anybody talking about hope. Yeah. And for good reasons, right? They look at the world and they see climate change. They see, you know, civil unrest. They mm -hmm. see the coming of, you know, destabilization of countries, borders, all this. They, they're looking at this world and they're frightened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm thinking about myself growing up in Western Canada in the 70s. I thought the world was stable. 
I can do all kinds of great things. It's just, mm -hmm. it's predictable. Yeah. And now we're seeing it isn't that for this generation at all. And so they're saying things like, I'm not going to have kids. Yeah. So in that kind of a context, you can't just say, well, I'll just have, have hope, right? As if hope right. is something like a vaccine. Yeah. And if you get it, you're going right. to be protected from all the trouble. And that's just, yeah. that's just lying to people. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm saying, instead of asking about what gives you hope is what are you prepared to love? Because if we can figure out what we're going to love and then learn how to activate that love within each other, mm -hmm. then we can face whatever bad stuff is going to come in a way that we couldn't if we were alone or right. just totally despairing about the world. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about your next. Sure. Tell us a little bit about, okay, this just came out, right? Agrarian Spirit. Yeah, this came out in August. Yeah. So cultivating faith, community, and the land. And you've got some, you've got some, some, some great endorsements here. You, you're, uh, um, you know, uh, well, I won't go through all that. Anyways, it's, it's, it's again, a great book. But uh, when I would see the word agrarian, I'd immediately think this book is not for me. I'm an urbanite. And, right. Uh, but I heard you one time, time say that an, an agrarian is someone who takes care of the places that, that flourish or nurture them. Right. So that's not necessarily a farmer. Right. So can you, do you, would you hold by that description? What's, what's yeah, agrarian? I think that's really important to say right off, right? What we've seen historically is the complete removal, not complete, mostly complete removal of farmers from the land because farming is now big business and it's done by a very small number of people because machines have taken over the land. Mm -hmm. And the way the, the land is now farmed is not according to the principles of traditional agriculture, which seek to grow fertility while they grow food. What we're seeing is the mining of fertility to grow commodities, right? Those are two vastly different enterprises. Wow, well put, well put, yeah. Say and that so again. We to... Say, that, say that, that's, that same two sentences again. Yeah, so farmers traditionally grew fertility of soil and food to eat. Right. Agribusiness, right, does not grow fertility. It mines fertility to produce commodities, right? right? So a lot of our land is not even producing anything human beings could eat. Right. Okay, so that's a signature move that happens at different times in different places, but it's pretty well entrenched all across the world now because mm -hmm. industrial agriculture is the mode in which so much of the caloric production is happening. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the, just the brief thing about farming. But so why am I still talking about an agrarian if there's such a small number of farmers left? Well, it's not to say that we should all become farmers, right? That's very important to say. Yeah. And then secondly, is to say that even if you're living in a city, you still got to take care of the place that nurtures you, because that's what you do when you nurture fertility in the land. You're you're nurturing the very places that are going to nurture you with the food that comes out of it. And even if you're living in a city, in a suburb. You still have to nurture your neighborhood because if you abandon your neighborhood, you're going to find you're living a whole lot less enjoyable. You're going to find it more dangerous, lonely, alienating. So the thing is, you learn to nurture the place that nurtures you. That's the fundamental agrarian commitment. And it's going to look different for people. Some, of, some folks will be able to grow gardens. Some folks will actually be involved in construction of a neighborhood, whether through housing or designing parks or whatever it's going to be. So the point is, what can you do to take care of the places that are already, already, always caring for your life? And this has, you know, big implications because now, instead of having a spirituality that figures out how to get you out of this world, because the world is such a mess, mm -hmm. right? The spirituality that I call up and away, instead you have down. a spirituality that's down and among, because you got to look down, right. right? What's making your living possible? Mm -hmm. And it's always land, water, plants, housing developments, neighborhoods, shopping centers, all these things that make our living possible. We got to take care of them. Mm -hmm. We got to design them in ways that are life giving. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, what we're seeing is that even in our cities, we've developed neighborhoods that are intent not on nurturing the people that live there, but sort of the the way to build houses as cheaply as possible so you, that the builder can maximize profit. What we see in cities is investment decisions, not the well-being of people, the well-being of creatures, the, the sort of health of land, the cleanliness of water, the cleanliness of air. So many of our development, our built environments, they don't reflect that we love where we are. Right. And so an agrarian is going to say, how do we learn to love where we are? Because when we love where we are, we also love all the beings that make their home there. Mm -hmm. 
And we can't live a good life. We can't live a hopeful life if we feel that the places that make our living possible are either being mined or degraded or abandoned. Right. If we do those things with our schools, with our hospitals, our houses, our fields, our forests, if we've got this mining or abandoning approach, we're going to slowly do in the possibility of a good life together. Mm -hmm. So agrarian spirit is really about how do we develop the kinds of spiritual practices or exercises that will draw us more closely into life with each other hmm. and life with our places through our places mm -hmm. so that what we see is instead of an escape from the world, but a deeper immersion into the world mm -hmm. so that we can see how, where we are is a place of blessing, but also a place that calls us to certain kinds of responsibilities of care and respect. Hmm. You, you go through like after your, your initial sort of essay on you know why agrarian right you you sort of tackle sort of various disciplines spiritual practices and disciplines right. and talk about them so i'll read i'll read sort of a chapter for each one and maybe you can pick one or two and sort of tell us what you mean by that like yeah like what what does a commitment to being an agrarian um have to do with learning to pray learning to see learning dissent learning humility learning generosity, learning to hope. So yeah. do you want to pick one or two of those? Or yeah. Those? So, I mean, let's, let's pick the one called seeing because that's my not, favorite one. Yeah. That's not traditionally characterized as spiritual practice, but I think it's so, so important because perception is our first sort of point of engagement with the world mm. and with each other. Yeah. And so we got to ask, how are we trained to see? How are we trained to perceive? Because everybody looks, mm -hmm. but what we see is vastly different. Mm -hmm. And what, how we see is a feature of the culture that we're in, the time that we're in. And so just to give an example, that's a very general one, is people have been trained, not through any sort of malicious intent or fault of their own, to see food as a commodity. That's mm -hmm. how we perceive it. Because you go into a grocery store, typical grocery store has got tens of thousands of products. Yeah. They're all there. Yeah. And they're mostly always there if you're living in North America. Yeah. And so we think, well, it's just stuff. Mm -hmm. It's just commodity. And that's a reflection of a larger pattern within modern culture in which we've commodified everything. We've commodified land. We've commodified creatures, plants, yeah. animals, but also workers so that every place, every creature, including human workers, mm -hmm. are units of production. That's mm -hmm. how we see them. That's and, how we perceive them. When when COVID happened and you you went for the first time to Costco and they didn't have what you wanted, A panic. You're, you're well. You're almost offended. Yeah, yeah. Like what what what's going on here? Like who's to blame? Like they, of course there should be this, or of course there should be that. And you know I couldn't get tonic water because yeah yeah. You know and I was and the first response was like almost offense at this lack of things that should be there. So I, I, I did notice that. But like, the thing is, you know, we've, we've got a vast infrastructure that includes railway lines, distribution yeah. centers, factories, pipelines, mm -hmm. electrical grids. All of it are designed to make you feel that everything is available to you mm -hmm. at a cheap price and at your convenience. Yeah. That's how we now perceive the world so that when something's not there, like you said, we're, we're offended. What do you mean? The world right. isn't available to my what, purchase right. and consumption. Yeah. So that's how we've been trained to see the world more generally. Mm -hmm. And of course, how does that train us to love where we are or to love the creatures we're with or to love other people? Mm -hmm. And so what I suggest is that from a Christian point of view, a, a spiritual point of view, we could never say, that another human being or another creature is simply a unit of production. Mm -hmm. Because from a theological or a scriptural point of view, the first thing to say about you or about any place is, as you read earlier, you are in the embodiment of God's love. Mm -hmm. That means when Christians meet other people, the first thing they say about them is not your sort of a, a number unit, production, unit of production or a unit of consumption. Mm -hmm. You are a child of God. Mm -hmm. that's a game changer because now what we see when we look at the world is not just a bunch of stuff that we can mine and appropriate and right. sell at the you know yeah. most profitable margin instead what we see is how the love of god is at work wherever there's a living being mm 
-hmm. And that means we have to treat forests differently. We have to treat fields differently. We have to treat, you know, what, what a bee is. I mean, bees are incredible. If we don't have bees, we literally stop eating mm -hmm. because bees play such an important role, pollinating plants and they make honey and they're just, they're beautiful creatures, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a way of coming to see the world, not as a commodity, but as a gift a gift that is sacred because it's it's the, the embodied expression mm -hmm. of a loving divine intention that its mm -hmm. goodness is part of its being from the beginning and we have to figure out how we're going to cherish the world because if we don't learn how to cherish the world we're going to put this world in a much better place than it already is mm -hmm. and so one of my hopes is that if we start to look at the world not through the lens of profit margins and quarterly statements, but instead start to look at the world as if it were in fact worthy of our cherishing, that will then have implications that are very practical mm -hmm. because we have to think about, you know, how do we grow our food in a way that honors the life of the food, the life of the animals, the life of the agricultural worker? How are we going to source energy that doesn't depend upon massive pollution, right? Or then you know, blowing up of mountains to get their coal Right? How are we going to you know, make clothing in a way that honors cotton, for instance, or flax mm -hmm. or whatever you know, elements you use to make the things that you wear? If we have in mind the question, how can we honor the life that makes our living possible? We're going to do a much better job living together. We'll find that we're much happier. We're much healthier people. Mm -hmm. It's not to say there won't be sadness or that there won't be tragedy. There will but at least we're going to be living in a world that we perceived to be worthy of our effort, worthy of our cherishing. Mm. Mm. There's a bunch of songs in that. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think one of the things I like about being a songwriter is that, I mean, I, like my, my brain, you know, immediately kind of bogs down with, you know, but there's, there's emergencies right now like this, like for, you know, it would take years for me to develop an agrarian spirit coming from the place that I've come from right. um, to really, really learn how to treat the world as, as, as all of it as gift or embodied sites of God's love. I mean, it, like it's, a, that's just such a, a, yeah. a changer thing. So we need to do that, but they're also in the meantime, there's some emergencies, some, there's some, yeah. you know, and so where does in, in all this, where does um, activism come in? Where does, because the, the, like it kind of looks like we're we're heading we're getting closer and closer to a bit of a cliff edge. Yep. Right. And it and and it used to be that that my great grandchildren might suffer, and then it's I think my grandchildren are going to suffer, and then it's I think my kids might suffer, and now I'm starting to think I might suffer. Right. Yeah. That. Like it's we're 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 headlong right now. Yep. So, given that, do you, what would you say about you know these practices? Yeah, take attention and time to really grow that, and of yep. course to 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 change our neighborhoods and all that, and then to change the systems, mm -hmm. and then how do we reimagine the economy? How do we reimagine transportation? How do we reimagine yeah, energy yeah. when we don't have time to really uh, do like so? Is it just sort of pick what you can? <laughs> well, I mean, it's a great question, Steve, and I I don't have a simple answer to it. I think yeah. I, what I want to say is that. It's not enough to reduce the work we need to do to personal virtue or vice, right? It's not about us saying, okay, I'm going to be vegan or I'm going to change my light bulbs or I'm going to get fair right. trade coffee. That's not enough, right? Mm -hmm. We do have to talk about systems, as you described. we got to mm -hmm. talk about built environments, how we're going to change them, how we're going to put in place better economies, mm -hmm. right, that will enable people to do what they want to do as the right thing. Right. We need to do all those things. But I think what agrarian spirit is saying is, is that we're not going to be able to do those things apart from certain kinds of practices in which we, first of all, come to feel our entanglement within the lives of others and see that entanglement not as a restriction on our freedom, but as an ability to sort of nurture mm -hmm. a fullness of life that we couldn't have had alone. Mm -hmm. right? And to do that, we really have to sense the life coursing through us of other people, other creatures of mm -hmm. places. And, you know, a question that I have for you is, you know, in the, in the chapter, I think it's the chapter on humility where I have the musical quota. Yeah. Remember yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I used the role there 
because Thoreau's got this wonderful journal entry where he says, I woke up and I had a dream that the whole earth sang through my body. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, that's such a beautiful image. I mean, it's an acoustical image, which is, yes. a, I think, a really important Auditory, thing to yeah. say. Yeah. But I think this is, you know, where, where songwriters and music can play such an important role because, you know, music is about listening. It's about hearing other notes going through other notes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and notes coming together in particular sorts of ways mm -hmm. to create something harmonious and symphonic and beautiful. Mm -hmm. And what I really would love is to see that people could imagine their bodies, not just as physical lumps moving around other lumps, but as a kind of acoustical phenomenon in which you can hear the vibrations of the world vibrating through your own body, mm -hmm. whether that's through your singing or through your activism, mm -hmm. right? That you feel that it's not just you anymore, mm -hmm. that you, you are in your embodied living and acting, giving voice to a world much greater, much bigger, much more complex than yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that is an important thing to get to because, first of all, it's empowering to know that you're not just by yourself, mm -hmm. but it also repositions human beings as first and foremost as witnesses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To the beauties of the world, but also witnesses to the sufferings of the world. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you can now in your life, give voice to a world bigger than you and help other people see the beauty and the suffering mm -hmm. so that together we can sort of mobilize to do better things than we're currently doing. I think, I think, you know, when when music is done well or done with that attentiveness, like I know in in my concerts, like you, there are times where you you get into the river, um, and and I always tell my, my manager, like you know, whether I have a good concert or a bad concert has nothing to do whether I performed well, or whether I made mistakes or sang in tune or right. like those things don't bother me. Um, it's I'm I'm always trying to get into that river, that that moment where you just yeah. feel that flow that I felt at the river that you're not just watching it, that it's through you. It's like, there's this, like, you know, like, like the flute, you know, the air yeah. through the flute. And you do feel, I, I don't want to overstate it, but you, you do really feel like you're being used in a beautiful, <laughs> yeah, beautiful, beautiful sense, but not so much. I mean, I, I know with Christian music, it's unfortunately it's, it becomes Christian because you're directing people's attention to a doctrine or a belief or whatever. And it's not like I'm against doctrines or, right. but, but it's like, that's, that's the low bar, you know, it, it, uh, to me, it's, you get beyond. Yeah. So I'll tell you this quickly. Um, I think this relates, but I've, I've played with symphonies, you know, and normally the symphony, you meet them the day of the concert, you rehearse for three hours, you put on your concert, um, and they don't know you, you don't know them. Um, and they're all good enough that the worst case scenario is it's going to be a great concert. Yep. Uh, but every once in a while you have a night where everybody attends to each other in a way that becomes almost miraculous. Yeah. And I remember one night with the Winnipeg Symphony and we were on stage and it was a particular song that was going and, and something in about the middle of the song, like, I try not to cry. It's like it possessed us. Yeah. And all of a sudden, out in the middle of the song, I'd get an intuition like, boy, we need to swell here, but that's not in their score. But we all did. Right? Or we need yeah. to slow down a little bit here, and we all did. Yeah. Like, you know, there was this, all of a sudden, there became this sort of this oneness thing. And it started to become almost, almost frightening. Like, it was just a bizarre, like how yeah. I was so deeply connected to the orchestra, to the panel player, the drummer, even though most of us couldn't even see each other. And there's this thing happening. And then the piano player started taking the solo at the end of a song. And Mike Jansen, he's brilliant. And he he was having a spectacular moment. And I, I'm looking at him. I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, this this is a highlight. This is good. This is a life memory right now. This guy, what yeah. he's doing. And so I dialed into him and I'm, I'm listening to his, his hands playing. And I'm just trying to adjust my playing. So for one, I'm not in the way. And two, that I give him something to push against and he can go further. I'm just trying to say, go, Mike, go, go. And also, yeah. I, I got you. And he he felt this and he looked up at me and our eyes locked. And we're staring at each other as he's doing his thing. And then all of a sudden, I realized that he was fascinated with what I was doing. <laughs> and he was adjusting his playing to push me. Yeah. And we were mutually pushing the other. It was mutual othering. 
at the same time. And in that moment, in that second, the whole scene froze in time and space, silently and motionless. And this voice says to me, pay attention. This is who I am. Oh. And then bang, we're back in, in time and space. And for the last 30 seconds of the song, I didn't know if I was going to vomit, pass out. Like it was just, it was such an overwhelming sense of I got way, way, way too close to the sun. Mm. And I had no business being there. But it changed everything. Wow, that's such a beautiful story, Steve. And, you know, hate to, hate to wreck it by bringing it back to something in, in the sacred life book. But, mm. you know, where I'm talking about creativity there, I said, mm. You know, this this concept of flow, which is well developed in psychology circles, right? That hmm. people are at their happiest when they feel that they're in the flow of what's happening, right? So yeah. a woodworker, when they're when they're in the groove, I mean yeah. time vanishes. Yeah. You're just totally yeah. immersed and yeah. in the presence, you're listening, you're accepting, you're yeah. you're improvising, you're responding, yeah. and you're in the zone. Yeah. You're in the and zone. Musicians and mechanics are like that, right? Musicians, jazz, uh, dentists, right. like doctors that just know right. know something that they didn't know two seconds ago. They just and, know. And you know, the, the psychologists who, who talk about this experience of flow say this is this is when people they're they're at their happiest. They're not like visibly joyous, jumping around laughing, yeah. but they're saying this is what life can be at its yeah. best. Yeah. And so I describe creativity as our participation, our improvisational mm -hmm. participation in the world's unfolding of itself, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, we can give lots of variations on that theme because, you know, we can be participating in the unfolding of a family's life or a neighborhood's life or a farm field's life or a classroom's life. I mean, all these ways of entering into flow are available to us. And when we give ourselves to what's potentially there, the beauties that are waiting there to be uncovered, right? Like think about when you're in the, in the zone making a meal and you're seeing what you've got and you're realizing, man, if I put, I put a little bit of this here, put a little bit of that there, this is going to be amazing. And then you eat it and you say, who could have thought that the world could taste this good? Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you're thinking, what do we need to do to make more of our day-to-day -day life? Right participating in that kind of experience of flow yeah that would be that would be phenomenal yep. because that's not about escaping the world because the world's consigned to oblivion anyway it's about entering into the world with patience and attentiveness and care and respect mm -hmm. and a deep posture of humility yeah and when that happens wow it's amazing and and to some degree, anticipatory joy. Like yeah. when my dad died, I learned about anticipatory grief. I didn't know what that was, but now I know. Um, but anticipatory joy, like when my when my wife, when I mean she she loves she loves to cook and she doesn't measure. You know, like she just throws a bit of this in, she throws in a bit of that, and you can sort of see like there's almost a dance when she's yeah. doing it. There's an anticipation of what's coming. Um, and, and she's right. And she can't write down her, I mean, in any sort of real detail recipes, because how do I know what yeah, I'm going to put that's in next lovely. time? Right. And so, but it's not, not without, um, uh, uh, you know, measurement entirely, but what I'm saying is that there's a, again, flow. And when you see somebody, when I see her in that zone, um, I, there's joy for me too. Like there's a, you know, um, and that's what I enjoy her so much, right? And that's, and then she gets her granddaughter in there, you know, and all that starts to happen. And so there, there might be a way of maybe us with us artists and and others um, that we can give witness to it by how we do our work, mm -hmm. and people and start to help people understand that this exists in your in your field in your work in your calling. Yeah, it'll look, it'll look different, right? You know, but a mechanic knows things oh yeah that they weren't taught you know um right. and you know so like there's just sort of different ways of of playing to that um we probably should, it's, it's been an hour and um and i could talk for another two or three. Oh, this is so much fun steve yeah listen so i want but i want readers i'll just i'll hold them up one more time this sacred life um humanity's place in a wounded world 
uh, put that in front of the camera, is opposite. <laughs> An Agrarian Spirit, Cultivating Faith, Community, and the Land by Norman Wurzbaugh. And if you go on, if you got a, a normanwurzbaugh.com website? Or- yeah, I got a normanwurzbaugh.com, but you can find them online all over yeah, the place. Everything's there. Lots of articles um, all over the place um, talking about the things we're talking about, about food, about soil. Like, there's a lot there. Um, so I'd encourage people to kind of check it out. Um, it's just wonderful stuff. And it's, you know, Norm, your work has really been very important to me, especially the last two years. Um, mm. Somehow, I, I guess maybe I was in a place to receive it that that in a newer, deeper way. So I just just want to say thanks. Well, thank you, Steve. That's very kind of you to say. It's been it's been so great to know you over the last few years. And maybe someday down the road, we'll collaborate. That would be yes. great. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> so for people that want to stick around, um, I'm just right now I'm going to play a brand new video. I, I played it for you. I, I sent it to you yesterday, a song I wrote with uh, Malcolm Guite called In Praise of Decay. Um, this, this, the song itself, the story is Malcolm's out on a walk with his dog through the forest in England and it's in the fall and, and all the leaves are losing their edges and they're modeling and, and there's that deep, musky, wonderful, wet smell in a forest mm. and that, that very uh, gorgeous sort of aroma of a forest. In the middle of the forest, he sees this plastic bag um, sticking out from the, 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 um, the, uh, the leaves and the, the thing that the humans made, um, it, it has this unfortunate quality that it doesn't decay. <laughs> And yeah. so he writes. He writes this beautiful poem called "In Praise of Decay." Yeah. Um, uh, as compared to the things, the dreadful things that last, and and of course the bay becomes a symbol of all that we've been sort of talking about. Um, so uh, we just put out the video like yesterday, and so um, in closing, I'll say goodbye to you. For those of you who want to stick around, here it is. It's um, a great song, folks. Get ready. <laughs> Love you, man. Hi to Gretchen. Love you too, Steve. Yeah. Great to be with you. You too. There were older ways of living Much wiser than the ways we've known Kinder and forgiving of the limits we're inclined to know Native to this land that God has given us to grow The seeds of love, the shoot of faith, the tree of hope sinning in the manufactured grim disgrace of betraying our beginnings with viral acts of greed and waste planted in the midst of these bewildering displays lies a garden tended by a lover's grace Perhaps it's not so bad that things decay That ocean breakers ebb and flow away That light ascends and settles at the ending of the day That beating hearts can stop and start again There's irreverence unfolding from the secrets of the lonely beast. And the arts of better knowing, of letting go and planting seeds. Blessed are the ones who herald wisdom from the past. To save us from these dreadful things that last Perhaps 
Cause it's not so bad that things decay That ocean breakers ebb and flow away That light ascends and settles at the ending of the day That beating hearts can stop and start again Perhaps it's not so bad that things decay Ocean breakers ebb and flow away That light ascends and settles at the ending of the day That beating hearts can stop 